Sri Lanka biodiversity scientist known for his contributions to the uh, taxonomy of amphibians and freshwater fish, a proud product of St. Thomas's College, Mount Lavinia. Dr. Pithya Gudar has authored significant works on the biodiversity of Sri Lanka and has been recognized globally for his conservation efforts. Notably, he received the prestigious Lenin Medal in 2022 for his contributions to zoology, becoming the first of Sri Lankan to earn this honor. Dr. Pithya Gudar founded the Wildlife Heritage Trust a foundation aimed at enhancing the biodiversity research in Sri Lanka and has been involved in various projects including conserving the abandoned tea plantations into natural forests, earning him the title of Rolex Laureate in 2000. His efforts have led to the uh, discovery and description of nearly 100 new species and several species have been named in his honour, reflecting his significant impact on the scientific community. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk us through imaging the natural world, please welcome Dr. Rohan Pithyakna. Secretary uh, Gunadasa Samarasinghe, Director General Chandra Surya Bandar, Deputy Director General Mr. Mandula, uh, Mandula, I forgot your surname. Yes, forgive me. Elanthi uh, and uh, uh, Sorry, Amar Ratna, it came to me. And um, I'm sorry, I got that mixed up. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to uh, spend a few uh, minutes reviewing the history of imaging that will, I hope, give you an idea of how we arrived at this place today. One of the first instincts of humans after we emerged from Africa about 100,000 years ago was to start drawing. And the earliest objects that we drew were not landscapes, they were not other humans, they were animals, they were wildlife. The oldest painting we know about is not far away from here, it is in Sulawesi in Indonesia, drawn 45,000 years ago of a wild boar. And more recently, about 30,000 years ago, in the cave in southern France, known as Lascaux, are these wonderful images drawn by people during the Stone Age. Even in Sri Lanka, we have many such drawings on rock walls. These have been studied by people like Professor Raj Somadeva and written about, but unfortunately we have not yet dated them. When finally they are dated, we may discover new depths of the history of our island. Even in earliest historical times, as we know from the Sandhakata Pahana and similar images from the Anuradhapura period, wildlife played a substantial role in Sri Lankan art and its celebrations. 
When we look at images of elephants in the Sandakara Pahana, or of cattle, or horses, they are very accurately depicted. However, when it comes to the Hansaya, the swan, clearly people in Sri Lanka had not seen a swan at that time. The swan was probably a mythical creature because swans are known in India also only in the northwestern sub-Himalayan region. We drew a quite different animal, a bird that looks more like a duck. And the same is true of the lion. The lions also were not accurately drawn because the artist who made this engraving probably had never seen a lion. Lions became extinct in Sri Lanka about 20,000 years ago, as did the tiger. And we know this from the fossils we find in places like Batadumbalena. And for that reason, these animals were not accurately de depicted. They were merely drawn from the word of mouth of other people. There was a long gap from the Rajarata civilization to the present era or the colonial era. And the first drawings of animals in the colonial era came only in the mid 1600s, in the mid 17th century. The uh, British author, Robert Knox, who spent several years in Sri Lanka, when he went back to England, he wrote a book in 1681 called A Historical Relation of Ceylon. And there, he published images of some Sri Lankan animals, but he was not an artist. So he had to describe these animals to other people who in turn depicted them. As you can see, his image of a macaque, a rilava, looks rather like a dog because the artist himself had never seen a macaque. When it came to the leaf monkey, it looked quite human because the artists had not seen the animal they drew. But by the middle of the 1600s, gradually specimens of animals from Sri Lanka were going to Europe. The earliest such drawing we know about was drawn in the early 1600s, the Patakolatelia, which was sent to Europe as a specimen, and that specimen still exists in Germany. The same with the Kolakanea, the, what we know now as Channa orientalis, an endemic species. These also, by the mid-1600s, had gone to Europe and came to be drawn. In fact, the name Channa, the scientific name Channa, comes from a corruption of the singular name, Kanea, because the Dutch wrote the K sound as CH. So they intended it to be pronounced as Kanna and not Chan. By the mid-1700s, in Europe, we see appearing images of our snakes like Hypnali, Lyriocephalus. This is published in 1735. But these were all drawn from dead specimens. And so when they drew a loris, this is how it turned out. Now in, wild, in the wild, you never see a loris like this. But gradually, as the 17th century and the 18th century progressed, quality of illustration improved until it became quite realistic. In 1637, an elephant from Sri Lanka was exported to Europe. It was sent uh, to the king in Sweden and eventually sold to a Dutch merchant for the amount that is the equivalent in today's money of 400 million rupees. This was a performing elephant called Hanska. It toured the length and breadth of Europe and people had to pay to watch it doing tricks and here you can see some of the tricks it was doing. And the Europeans had, at that time never seen a performing animal before. Elephants are much more intelligent than any animal you get in Europe. And so 
the owner was able to make a huge amount of money by exhibiting this elephant going from town to town, village to village, showing this Sri Lankan elephant off. So well known was the elephant that even the famous artist Rembrandt drew a picture of it. And when this elephant died in the city of Florence in Italy, eventually, it was preserved and its skeleton is still in that museum, the Natural History Museum in Florence. And now it is the so-called lectotype, in other words, the specimen of the elephant that is the zoology, the original specimen. And the genus Elephas also takes its name from this specimen. The Sri Lankan specimens by then were going to Europe quite frequently. In the middle of the 1700s, in about 1750, the Dutch governor in Sri Lanka was particularly fond of wildlife. He was a, a man who was in love with Sri Lanka, though he was a colonial governor. It was him uh, who originally organized for monks from Kandy to be sent to Thailand, to Siam, and founded the Siam Nikaya so that monks from Sri Lanka could get the Upasam Upasampadava in Thailand. The Siam Nikaya was effectively founded by Governor Lothar. He gave Dutch ships to take the monks to Burma and come back with Burmese monks to Kandy. And he found a local artist called uh, Peter de Bivier, whose job was to draw the animals in his little zoo. And these now are becoming quite lifelike because the artist has finally seen the actual animals he was drawing. The sunbird on the top left there is named after Lothan, Lothan Sunbird. Meanwhile, nobody had really taken interest in the plants of Sri Lanka. Well, not in drawing the plants of Sri Lanka. But the Dutch had widely explored the flora of this island. Between 1717 and 1747, three books were published in Europe on the flora of Sri Lanka. That was its importance at the time. But in the early 1800s, the British had occasion to start a botanic garden in Kaluta. They later moved it to Peradeniya in about 1822, but the first botanic garden they had was at Kalutara. And there at Kalutara, the botanic garden found a young man, an artist, called Harmanis Vialvis Saniviratna, and they commissioned him to start drawing the plants of Sri Lanka. Harmanis lived to an age of more than 100, and he and his sons and grandsons, people like William de Alvis Saniviratna, George de Alvis Saniviratna, they became a family of plant artists. They went to India, to Singapore even, as artists commissioned to draw the floras of those countries. Harmanis' and his son's paintings are still in the National Herbarium in Peradeniya, but sadly not being exhibited. These are beautiful parts of the Sri Lankan heritage drawn almost 200 years ago by a young village lad from Kalutara. By the middle of the 19th century, artists who were quite famous were arriving in Sri Lanka to draw the plants. Marian North was one of them, and her paintings are still in Kew Gardens of things like jackfruit with the acavus, the snail beside it, and pitcher plants. And so, illustrating Sri Lanka's plants and animals had got well underway. By about 1860, another artist called Hippolyte Silva had started drawing the fishes and other marine life of Sri Lanka. Hippolyte Silva drew almost 600 species of marine animals uh, found around Colombo. And these paintings were lost for 150 years until they turned up in 1992 in an antique warehouse in the Netherlands. At that time I heard about it and I got a whole bunch of friends, like some of you here present in fact, to contribute money and we bought it for the National Museum in Colombo. That was more than 30 years ago. Sadly, that collection still is in the museum, I hope but it has also never been exhibited. This is a unique part of Sri Lanka's natural history heritage. Hippolyte Silva was a talented artist. This is another of his drawings, which was published in Emerson's Tenant's Natural History of Ceylon. And as you can see, the 
though the pictures are in a special style, they are very lifelike and realistic because he had seen the animals in the wild. And that was just about the time when photography was beginning, in the mid-1800s. So the first true photographer that we had was this man, Lawton. He was a Tamil gentleman from Batikalo. He used a photographic style, a photographic style that was known as a daguerreotype. And he did portraits in this form in Batiklo and then later in Kandy. He has to be recognized as the first Sri Lankan photographer. But then, by the end of the 1870s, there appeared in Sri Lanka an altogether remarkable woman. She was married to Charles Hay Cameron, who was the uh, person who made the biggest difference to Sri Lanka as we know it today. I'll go into that in a minute. But she was a remarkable woman, Julia Margaret Cameron. She was one of the earliest women photographers in the world. And she brought her equipment and her art to Sri Lanka together with her husband later in life. They were so in love with this country that when they finally retired in England, they decided that they had to die in Sri Lanka. So they bought two coffins and a cow because they liked milk. And they came to Sri Lanka in 1873 and lived for about six or seven years before they both died. And it was Charles A. Cameron who was the co-author of the Ceylon Charter of Justice of 1833. I'm saying this because it's an important and interesting part of our history in the sense that it was this document, one of the most precious documents that I own, which I have left in my will to the National Archives. The Charter of Justice outlined the establishment of the Legislative Council in Sri Lanka and the Executive Council. For the first time in Sri Lanka's history, ordinary citizens were able to advise the government. We had some kind of representative government. They established the Education Commission so that normal people could get an education in Sri Lanka, which until then you either got in the Pirivana or in the church school. Importantly, they also unified Sri Lanka. We refer to Sri Lanka as a unitary state. You refer this quite often, you hear this quite often. What it meant at that time was that after the British took over the Kota Kingdom, around 1798. The Candian Kingdom remained independent in 1815 till the Candian Convention, but the two units were administered as two separate countries by the British. Then in 1833, Holbrook Cameron report insisted that they be joined into one country called Ceylon. So we get a unitary state also thanks to Charles Hay Cameron. And the admitted Sri Lankan citizens, not just white people, into the public service and abolished Rajakarya, which until then had been a form of involuntary servitude imposed by the government, including the Dutch government. The British, from that day onwards, said that they will pay for any service that we do to the government and they will not take it free. So, the two Camerons are buried in Sri Lanka two very famous people by any standard in the world. Julia Margaret Cameron is even in Britain a celebrated pioneer of photography. They are buried in uh, near Bhagavan Talawa in St. Mary's Church in the churchyard. And as you can see, it's completely neglected. Um, but this should be a heritage site in Sri Lanka because this was a true pioneer of the art of photography worldwide. And her paintings, are, her portraits are hanging in, for example, the National Portrait Gallery in the United Kingdom. This is a picture of Marian North in the veranda of Julia Margaret Cameron's house in Kaluthara, and she's painting. The photo itself is invaluable, taken by Cameron. She's painting a little boy who's posing in the veranda. He took 
hundreds of portraits, about 60 of Sri Lankan portraits are surviving, which are very striking considering that these were done in the 1870s, very striking in their character and in the art of portraiture. This was a servant in her house. As Julia Margaret Cameron died, I think in 1879, we had a new phase of photography starting with two Swiss cousins, Paul and Fritz Saracen. They were two rich guys, highly educated anthropologists from Switzerland who came and spent a lot of time in Sri Lanka over the next 20 years. Having arrived here on their private yacht, they walked the length and breadth of Sri Lanka. They didn't take any horses, they decided to walk. And they were two excellent photographers. This is in the early 1800s. And it's their photos from which we know, for example, what the Kupa Rame looked like at that time, what Colombo Port looked like in the age of sail. This is the top of Devon Falls, near Thalavakale, in the age of coffee, before tea had been planted in Sri Lanka, Lake Gregory in Norelia, Akbala as seen from Ramboda. And the Saracen cousins also started a new trend of popularizing Sri Lanka, then Ceylon, as a tourist destination, with images like this. Tourists who came to Sri Lanka, and still ones who come to Sri Lanka, take photographs of catamarans and elephants bathing, and the view from Sri Pada at dawn, and until they were made illegal bullock carts. And these images went round the world to popularize Sri Lanka as a tourist destination, already 150 years ago. And they took many other images of Isurumonia, Mahintale, and you see the monk in the pictures meditating on the side of the rock and many places in Anuradhapura, the famous temples that we have now, Ruan Valley Sayaya, Abhayagiriya, and so on. They also started imaging the people of Sri Lanka. They took hundreds of photographs, for example, of the Vadda people, and by then they had brought to Sri Lanka a film that was a bit faster, lower exposure time, than had been used before. Here you see two of their photographs side by side. In those days, when you took a picture, you had to tell the subject to stand still and not to move, which is why wildlife photography was almost impossible. Because if the animal was moving, the film would blur. And you can see from the fact that they were able to photograph dancing in the Vatta community, that now the quality of film was becoming better and better. And when they could, manage the subjects in their pictures here in an elephant kraal, the traditional method of cap capturing elephants, they uh, were able to tell people to stand still to get clear pictures. And so we have these documents of how elephants were captured in those times by traditional methods, not just that, but even the Perahara candy was depicted in photographs for the first time around 1880. And then we have the age, the first beginnings of the age of natural history photography. While excavating a site near Peradenia, the Saracens encountered an ichthyophis, a Sicilian. This is an endemic Sri Lankan amphibian. It was with a nest and its eggs. And they quickly took a photograph. But of course, this, the place was too dark, so they couldn't publish the photograph. They went to the Peradeniya Gardens with their photograph, and they asked one of the Alvis family to draw it for them, and this is that drawing. This became one of the most famous natural history drawings in the world at the end of the 19th century. It was such a remarkable picture. It is probably the first actual portrait of biology in life in Sri Lanka. But of course, the Saracens were not perfect people. They also shot elephants for sport. Here you can see one of them sitting on an elephant that they have shot, holding in his left hand the tail and his right hand the uh, knife, the dagger with which he had cut it out. 
at about the same time the Saracens were here making those early explorations, there were two people in England, two brothers, Richard and Cherry Keaton, who had become the world's first wildlife photographer. This was in the 1890s. And they began the first, of taking the first photographs, for example, of birds, birds' nests, fledgling birds, reptiles, and so on. In 1898, they published the world's first book on wildlife photography called With Nature and a Camera. These guys were really serious wildlife photographers. They did crazy things to get to nest, to take pictures of nesting birds, climbing trees, scaling down cliffs, making weird tripods standing on each other to get to the bird's nest. And even the cow you see on the right-hand side picture there is actually a, not a real cow. They made this cow so that they can hide in it and take pictures of wildlife that were frightened when humans were around. So as Sri Lanka entered the 20th century, the early 1900s, photography was beginning to become ever better. By 1911, National Geographic, which was one of the most famous magazines in the world for photography, sent a team out to Sri Lanka to photograph the whole island. This is a picture of the, one of the last pearl fisheries that took place in Aripunia Manam at that time. You can see at the bottom left-hand side of the picture is quite blurred because the waves are crashing and the, and the men are moving around. And that's because despite the strong sunlight in Manor and using a pinhole camera, you still couldn't uh, have film that was fast enough to capture a moving image. So the National Geographic magazine of 2012 uh, is one of my proudest positions in my library. This is dedicated to Sri Lanka with some magnificent images, like the elephant you see here. And you consider that this photograph was taken 120 years ago, it is altogether fantastic. The quality is amazing. And it also gives us an essence of what Sri Lanka was like at that time. I want you to think of that in the context of what you're doing here. Some of the animals that you might be photographing today might be extinct 50 years from now. Yours might be the best images that will ever be taken of these animals. You are also archivists in addition to being artists. And similar to the, the Saracens and that tradition, by the early 1900s, people like Skeen and Plater were taking hundreds of pictures of Sri Lankan uh, scenes and scenery and sending them all over the world about this strange and wonderful island. When naturalists like W.W.A. Phillips came to study the birds and the mammals in the 1930s, Photography was already available to them, and they used this technique in black and white as best they could. But the speed of film was still very, very slow, and that persisted until the 1950s. Uh, the ISO numbers they used in those days, I think, was typically like 30 to somewhere there. Very slow film. And the man who made a difference in Sri Lanka happened to be working for the institution that Mr. Ranjan Marasinghe today is heading. He was assistant director at the Zoological Gardens, Ranjan, Rodney John Press. And uh, he was a brilliant diver. He learned to dive himself. And I'm going to show you a little movie, if it works, of him in the Great Basses. This is in the mid-1950s. Scuba diving had just been invented. He had never been trained as a scuba diver. But he was a very brave man. And now, as you can see, color film has arrived in Sri Lanka. And the sensitivity of the film is enough to facilitate underwater film. Uh, Rodney Jonkras was my guru when I started studying fish in the 1980s. He took me to many interesting places, uh, took me diving with him, and uh, in many ways taught me much of what I understand about fish now. These are a few groupers that he had learned to hand feed in the great basses. As you can see, they're very tame and coming very close to him because he was feeding them by hand. He was petting them like a dog. He's very, can you see that? Very uh, 